All right, so welcome back. We are finally to our very last screencast for Chapter 7. Uh, chapter 7 is focused on three things. In the beginning, we focused a little bit on history. In 7.2, we looked at cell structure, and in 7.3, we're going to look at cell transport. Now, as I had stated at the beginning of the chapter, when we talk about cell transport, we're talking about moving materials from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. And so we're going to look at some different methods that that can be accomplished within the cell. So taking a look at this very first slide, you're going to notice we have some information that will sort of help us review um, some important parts of the cell membrane, and we're even going to touch a little bit on the cell wall. Now, if you remember back when we talked about um, cell structure, we had mentioned that all cells do have a cell membrane, and this cell membrane is going to be made of two parts. It's going to be made of a protein layer, and it's going to be made of a lipid or a fatty layer. And when you talk about the fatty layer, it's going to be made up of actually two individual fatty layers. Now embedded within those layers are going to be proteins. Now those proteins are important because what they do is they form a channel. And that channel is going to allow larger molecules inside of the cell. Now what's really neat about these channels is that they can actually either open or close. So they can sort of help to determine what's going to go in and actually what's going to come out of the cell. Now some cells have cell membranes and they also have cell walls in addition to those membranes. Um, organisms like plants, fungus, and even some bacteria are going to have a cell wall. Now if you look down at these diagrams, we have an animal cell on this side and we have a plant cell on this side. Now on the left, you can see the cell membrane represented right here. Now on the right, you can also see the cell membrane being represented right here. But in addition to those membranes, in a plant cell, we also have something called a cell wall. And so you're going to see that cell wall right on the outside of that membrane. So it's going to do a couple of things for the plant. One of those, of course, is going to be protection. It's going to help to protect those cells. And another thing it's going to do is it's going to help those plants to remain upright. So remember, those cell walls were made of cellulose. And so that was a complex carb. And so one of the primary functions of that cellulose is to make sure that the plant can stand upright and remain rigid. So as we make our way through um, 7.3, what we're going to do is, as I had said before, when we first started the screencast, we're going to look at some various ways that materials can be brought across that cell membrane. Um, one of the simplest ways that can occur is through the um, method of diffusion. Now diffusion is the passing of substances from a region of high concentration of the substance to a region of low concentration of that substance. And that's going to continue to happen until we reach a state called equilibrium. Now looking down here at the diagram, you're going to notice that we have some green spheres and we also have some purplish pink spheres. Now in this very first diagram, you're going to notice all the greens are on the left and all the pinks are on the right. But what we're having occur here is that some of the pinks are moving to the left and some of the greens are moving to the right. Now in picture number two, you'll notice some of the purples or pinks have actually moved to the left, so we have a couple on this side, and we also have some of the greens that are now on this side, so they're starting to mix up a bit. Now once we reach a state of equilibrium in the third picture here, you're going to notice we have about the same amount of molecules on both sides. So if we imagine that this is our cell membrane, right through here, you're going to see that if we were to count these molecules, one, two, three, four, five, six, we have six green ones on this side, and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, and we have six on this side. So we have a state of equilibrium that's been reached for the green molecules. Now we could do the same thing for the pink or purple molecules. We have one, two, three here, and we have one, two, three here. So again, when we talk about diffusion, we're talking about going from an area of high concentration to a region of low concentration. So the greens were really high on the left, and then they eventually, over a period of time, made their way to the right. And the same thing went for the pinks. They were high on the right, and eventually, after a period of time, they were the same amount on the left as well. Now particles will continue to move back and forth, but there will be no net change in concentration. Now what that means is that some people believe that once the molecules reach a state of equilibrium that there's no more molecule movement between the two sides of the cell membrane and that's not true. What that simply means is that the molecules will continue to move back and forth. Now in addition to simple diffusion we also need to make sure that we talk about something called facilitated diffusion. Now when you use the word facilitate you need to think about the word help. 
So what we have in the cell membrane is we have special proteins that are considered protein carriers or protein channels. And their job is to help larger molecules across the cell membrane. Um, an example of a larger molecule would be something like glucose. Um, remember, that was one of the macro or big molecules. And so these protein channels or carriers would be helping these larger molecules go from the outside of the cell, make their way to the inside of the cell. In other words, these molecules are so large they can't fit through the lipid bilayer. And so what they're going to do is they're going to change shape as these molecules enter the protein channel, they're going to change shape and basically be spit out on the other side. Now something that's kind of interesting about the protein channels is that they are actually very specific to the type of molecule that they're going to help through um, the membrane. If you notice on the left hand side here, these particular molecules can only pass through this channel. And these particular molecules can only pass through this channel. Now it says the movement of molecules by facilitated diffusion does not require any additional use of the cell's energy. So in other words, it's still considered diffusion. We're still going from an area of high concentration down to an area of low concentration. Now one example of facilitated diffusion that we need to make sure that we mention is one called osmosis. Now osmosis is the diffusion of water through a selectively permeable membrane. Now we're still going to go from an area of high to an area of low concentration. On the right hand side you're going to notice the selectively permeable membrane is represented by this line right here. So this is going to represent the cell membrane in our example. And if you notice on the left hand side we have lots of water to start off with but it's going to move gradually to the right. Now it's selectively permeable in a way that only the water can actually pass through. The molecules that you see in green which represent sugar molecules they're too large to pass through this membrane so the water is the only thing that can pass through and so that's why you see a change in water levels on the right hand side. Now depending on the type of solution or environment that the cell is in is going to determine how it's going to react. So what we have here is we have three different types of solutions. We have one called a hypertonic solution, an isotonic solution, and a hypotonic solution. Now an isotonic solution would be something like um, our red blood cells for example. They are bathed in an isotonic solution. Now because they're bathed in an isotonic solution what that means is that the concentration of solute which is the material that the fluid that, that is dissolved within the fluid is the same on both sides. So for example if we um, look at these red blood cells and let's say for example that the um, solution that they're bathed in is let's say 5% sugar or salt and we look at the inside of the cell and the, the concentration of either salt or sugar is also 5%. Because it's the same on both sides, you're going to find that the water is going to go in at about the same rate as it goes out. Now if you're talking about a hypertonic solution, you're going to find that the environment on the outside is going to be higher in terms of solute concentration. And what that means is, for example, we might have 10% salt on the outside, but only maybe 5% on the inside. So in actuality there's actually more water on the inside of the cell than there is on the outside in the environment. And so the water is going to tend to rush out of the cell which is going to cause the cell to shrink. Now the hypotonic situation is a little bit different. So what we have here is that on the outside we have maybe a 5% salt or sugar solution but on the inside of the cell we have a 10% salt or sugar solution. So in that case there's actually more salt on the inside than there is on the outside. And so the natural tendency to be is that the water is going to rush in to equalize um, the solutions. And so a result of that is that the cells themselves are going to swell up. And if they're animal cells, sometimes they do tend to burst. Now in plants the same exact thing happens. Um, but the situation here is that because we have something called a cell wall outside of the cell membrane, what you're going to see is that actually the cells will not burst as they would in an animal cell. Now it says in plants the net movement of water out of or into a cell is going to exert a force known as osmotic pressure. So again that osmotic pressure is really important because in order for a plant to stand upright there has to be intense pressure on the outside of that cell. So in this case the pressure is really important. So the final type of transport that we're going to look at is one called active transport. 
Cells sometimes have to move materials from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. Now I want you to think back to simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion. If you think about those two processes, we were actually moving materials from an area of high to an area of low. That's the natural tendency of molecules to move from high to low. But in this case, we're going to go the opposite direction. We're going to go from low to high. Now the only way that this can happen is if energy is put into the system by the cell. Energy is required as molecules must be pumped against the concentration gradient. And you can see this happening on the right hand side. In the animation, we have these red molecules that are constantly being pumped to the right hand side. But the only way that can happen is by the input of energy. Once you get a lot of molecules on this side, before the natural tendency would be for those molecules to move back to the left hand side. But because we put energy into the system, the cell puts energy into the system, we can continue to move those red molecules across to the right. Now down below you're going to see another example of active transport. Our cells often accumulate lots of carbon dioxide, lots of CO2. That's the gas that we breathe out. So we need to be able to get rid of that gas rather effectively. Now inside of the cell sometimes um, we'll have lots of CO2, so it will go ahead and move to the outside. But once there's a lot of CO2 on the outside, if it was simple diffusion or facilitated diffusion, it would actually start to move back this way. But because our cells can actually put energy into the system, we can continue to move that CO2 out of our cells. So another example of active transport would be endocytosis and exocytosis. Now I want you to focus on the prefix for each of these words. We have endo here and we have exo here. Endo means in and exo will mean out. Now the primary reason why a cell would use endo or exocytosis is to bring large molecules into the cell or to remove large molecules from the cell. Um, endocytosis is when you're going to have the cell membrane form a pocket around a particle and when it forms that pocket, that pocket becomes something called a vesicle and it's going to use that vesicle to bring that material inside of the cell. If you look on the right hand side, give it just a second, you're going to see that as the molecule makes its way towards the cell membrane, that pocket's going to be formed. Now, if that pocket is a material that no longer is needed by the cell, same thing is going to happen in reverse. That pocket's going to be brought very close to the edge of the cell, and simply that material is going to be um, thrown out of the cell. So again, endocytosis will work to bring things into the cell, and exocytosis will work to bring large molecules to the outside of the cell. All right, so that's going to finish up our um, last screencast for Chapter 7. Um, as always, please make sure that you complete the screencast notes before coming to class.